We continue with 2020's Tragedy on TV. Now take a look behind me. As you can see, this is a road to nowhere. When aspiring to get to network television, local reporters will often tell you their reel is everything. What kind of music is it and what makes it? A compilation of clips that showcase a correspondent's on-air charisma and creativity. Nicely done. In Vester Flanagan's case, not so much. A man bit a dog. It happened Friday morning when police went looking for the suspect. He's lucky that dog didn't do a little bit more. Flanagan had struggled in small TV markets around the country for years, never making his mark in the media. Vester Flanagan, WTOC News. But ironically, in those fateful morning hours of Wednesday, Flanagan would produce his own demise and that of two others, like he would one of his news packages, not on TV, but filming it all on his phone, spewing bitterness and frustration on social media. This is all about you look at me, you respect me, I'm not a bad person, these are bad people, and I got rid of them. Obviously, none of that makes any rational sense, but in his mind, he sort of hit the jackpot of attention getting. Before it all went so wrong, Flanagan's life seemingly started full of promise here in that other city by the bay, Oakland, California. At Skyline High School, proud home of the Titans, Flanagan was one of those cool kids. His yearbook shows a popular and outgoing student who was voted junior prom court prince. Where all the cute girls were hung out with Esther, but he wasn't really dating them. He was the best dressed guy in school. Very good looking young man. It turns out the reason Flanagan didn't like to date girls was because he preferred guys. Like I told my friend, I was like, well, you know, Vester, I think he, I think he might be gay, but, but I think back then it wasn't the thing to come out as a, a gay black male. As shown on his Twitter feed, since an early age, Flanagan's good looks landed him work as a part-time model. But his real dream was to make it big in television news. He majored in broadcast journalism at San Francisco State University and also landed an internship at KPIX TV in San Francisco. Live in the Eyewitness News. Where he made an impression on former anchor Barbara Rogers. In the years that I knew him in the early 90s, he was like so many other young people who come through the newsroom, happy to be in the TV station, happy to have his foot in the door on his first job, eager to do a good job. Flanagan launched his on-air career in relative obscurity in dusty, oil-rich Midland, Texas, where he filed reports for KMID television. But you know, the next time you're at the convenience store, don't be so quick to give away that spare change in your pocket. After a brief stint, he moved on to the Spanish moss oak trees and antebellum homes of Savannah, Georgia, reporting for WTOC. Each year here in Savannah, small businesses pump $1.6 billion. Everyone was just starting out, so there was a lot of energy, a lot of um, ambition. Elaine Reyes was another young, fresh-faced reporter at WTOC who never saw anything sinister lurking behind Flanagan's million-dollar smile. We're going to go inside and check out the anchoring. I didn't personally have any issues with him. He was sometimes silly or goofy, as I think maybe we all can be in stressful newsrooms. He seemed like any other young reporter trying to make it in the world. But there was one thing that seemed to set him apart, she says, a laser-focused ambition to be famous. He'd go out and shoot his own stories in a three-piece suit. I think it was because he had ambitions for greater things. He wanted to be an anchor. He wanted to move up to a bigger market. And in 1999, it looked like his ship had finally come in here in the Florida panhandle, Tallahassee, the Sunshine State's capital. Flanagan landed his promising job with WTWC. Don Schaefer was the news director. He did a pretty good job. He, had, uh, he was a funny guy. He could do good live shots. He could speak and walk and talk. And, and uh, we actually, you know, he did so well for us, we actually moved him into a, uh, an anchor slot. Finally tonight, a day at the beach brings in big bucks for the American Cancer Society. Flanagan settled into this Tallahassee apartment complex, convinced that his career was about to take off. I'm Vester Flanagan. Have a good night. But it was all about to go south. A watershed moment one day when Schaefer says Flanagan showed up for work, not in that three-piece suit, but in tights. 
There were some questions about whether or not he was uh, gay or not. He had heard some comments over the, uh, the headphones in the studio when he was anchoring and some other times where they were making fun of him or making comments about him. You know, zoom in on the gay boy or have him turn uh, his head or something like that. And he really took exception to that. Schaefer says that was a turning point for Flanagan. All of a sudden, the formerly affable reporter turned on his colleagues, lashing out at any perceived slight. The station's meteorologist, Nancy Dignan, says she was one of the targets of Flanagan's hostility after she told him he made a small mistake during a broadcast. He used the term on air, um, opening arguments, and I said it's opening statements, not opening arguments. He came over and he started pretty quickly yelling at me. Um, and when I say yelling, screaming, um, you're not my news director, you're not my general manager, and on and on and on. And I was a little intimidated and nervous. In barely a year, Schaefer says the situation at the station had become intolerable, and he was forced to fire Flanagan. But that wasn't the end of it. Schaefer says Flanagan tried to sue the station for sexual discrimination. Through our attorneys and through his attorney, we had to tell him that being gay was not a protected class, and he had no grounds to sue over that. So then he quickly changed it to racial discrimination. In the suit, Flanagan claimed a producer called him a monkey, and that other blacks were ridiculed as lazy. I thought that he was deeply troubled by the comments that had been made to him. His attorney at the time, Marie Maddox, says she found Flanagan's allegation credible. He was consistent and consistently told me the same thing that had happened. Um, he appeared to be uh, hurt by what had happened and in telling the story, uh, I felt that he was genuine in terms of what he represented to me. I absolutely researched each and every one of those and the people who said they made him and I, did, I couldn't find anything. The GM and I both got involved with that. Uh, corporate sent in some people and checked it out. We, uh, we did a pretty thorough investigation and didn't really find much evidence of that at all. In the end, the suit was settled out of court. But with his career in TV now in tatters, Flanagan was on a different path, one of destruction that would lead him here to that unsuspecting Roanoke station, WDBJ, and an explosive confrontation. He slammed his fist down on the table and he looked at me and threw a, a wooden cross at me and said, you're going to need these.